So I was going to talk briefly about two sort of side topics, uh, features you can use with Dallinger. One is waiting rooms and the other is WebSockets. So these are both sort of optional features that make sense in a subset of experimental contexts, I guess. So talk about waiting rooms first. Um, yeah, a few subtopics. So the basic scenario with when you'd use one is it's the scenario where you need uh, a fixed number of people for an activity to make sense at all. Like it's a game for 10 people and it, no one can start until you've got 10 people ready. And then you want them to all start simultaneously. And um, Dallinger provides a default waiting room that you can just use and will work in a lot of cases. The way you use it is generally you have the last instruction page or the only instruction page. If you just have one, direct the person to the waiting room. Um, and we've got a little automatically updating widget so everyone that's sitting in the waiting room will see that things are progressing and that they're getting closer to actually joining the experiment. And then when it's full, uh, everyone is simultaneously sent to the experiment page. And this is uh, the default Dallinger waiting room template. And I won't go over this in a lot of detail, but basically the, the first half is the, the top section, the, the body block holds the little message about you know, you are in a waiting room now. And we've got the element that shows the progress bar. And then the script part at the bottom does the, the meat of the waiting room work. So it calls create participant. So uh, you don't, one important thing to know is if you're going to use the waiting room, you don't want to call create participant yourself because when they're sent to the waiting room, that'll happen. And um, it waits for a uh, message back from, from the server about the status of the create participant call. And one possibility, if I'll show a bit more of the actual Flask route, the, the server side, but um, a, one possibility is that the server will conclude that we already have enough people and this person isn't needed at all. And it will set skip experiment on the Dallinger JavaScript objects. And in that case, we explain that we've already got enough people click below to complete the hit. You'll still be paid for the hit, but you're not going to go into the experiment itself. So yeah, this could be overridden with more explanatory language or whatever you wanted as long as you have those core elements still. So this is sort of the, the minimum stuff you have to do to integrate with the default waiting room. Um, yeah, step one. Based on their, this would be, the, the top section would be in like the, the JavaScript for the instruction page. You'd have a button like the, I've read the instructions, I'm ready to progress, uh, ready to proceed. When they click that button, you would send them to the waiting page, which is the predefined Dallinger waiting room. And there's the example button that you would use. Um, the other thing, the, th the, the critical bit that sort of activates the entire waiting room system is the presence of a non-zero or, or non-false, I guess, quorum value on your experiment class. So if you require 10 people, you would want to set quorum equals 10. And if if it's always going to be 10, you can just do that as a class attribute. 
Um, I guess you could also do something fancy with setting that dynamically, but generally it's static. And then you need to recruit more people than you need because you might have people leave the waiting room without reaching quorum and you don't want to get in a situation where you need 10 people and you've only got nine and no one else is going to come because you didn't recruit anymore. And we found, I think through hard experience that massively over recruiting potentially is very effective in getting a lot of people quickly. And I think, yeah, I wanted Jordan to talk a bit more about that because he yeah, so That's one of the questions we've asked is, what is the, largest, uh, sim what is the largest group of participants that you can simultaneously get to come together on the mechanical turn? And um, the answer to that is unknown, but it's at least like 250 people. Jeez. And the question is, how do you do that? And they're, one of the major useful techniques is over recruitment. I don't know if this complies with the mechanical ter terms of service, but one of the things that is possible to do is to create um, basically an arbitrarily large hit that is a hit with many, 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 many assignments, more assignments than there are available people. Um, that's totally <coughs> fine. You can do that, no problem. Um, you can also then stop it whenever you want. So, in, so um, what we, we've there's kind of two use cases. One of them is just running experiments normally. And there, what we've done is over recruitment, where basically what we say is, we really just need to get 50 people all there at the same time. And the only way to get 50 people all there at the same time, if you try to recruit 50, then the issue is that uh, if, if your initial recruitment is 50 and your goal is to get 50 people at the same time, you're rate limited by whoever arrives last, right? Of the 50, that your, your timing depends on the 50th person. Uh, and only when the 50th person arrives do you have 50 people. And uh, with a tool like Mechanical Turk, if you open a hit with 50 people, um, that 50th person is not going to arrive uh, instantly, in part because like ranking of your hit on the system depends on the number of, of, of assignments that are available. So if you did something like double recruitment or triple recruitment, where, say, you open up 100 assignments or 150 assignments, um, you can that 50th participant will come much sooner than they would had you only opened up 50 assignments. Um, the question is then really what do you do with all the other people and you have choices there. You can design an experiment that just says, oh, thank you for participating. We didn't actually need you to participate. Here's your, here's the, the, the payment. Thank you. Uh, they love that though. It just means that your experiment costs two to three times as much as it would otherwise. Um, alternatively, if you have some kind of individual task that they're, that, they're, that it's possible for them to do, you can have some kind of conditional logic that says, mm -hmm. if you're part of the main group, then go to the mm -hmm. actual experiment. Otherwise, go to the some other survey that you just happen to want to run mm -hmm. in the context of that experiment mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. some other context. And that, that would be fine, too. Um, the double and triple recruitment is really successful. Um, you, can, you, can, you can, like, we can really, really reliably get 20 people simultaneously by doing double recruitment. Um, and we've pushed as high as we can go there. Um, as you want bigger and bigger numbers, um, like, uh, like actually, it's actually smaller numbers benefit more from over recruitment in that, uh, like, it's hard, it's actually pretty hard to get, like, eight people there simultaneously if you don't over recruit. Um, uh, and so that, yeah, that's, 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 that's the major. So how do you do? Hundred people simultaneously, or two hundred people simultaneously, yeah. because the wouldn't like the waiting time be a bit, because like until all those slots fill, even if you put like, over recruit by a factor of yeah, two. Do you want to see figures? Uh, if the answer is you just do it, yeah, it's why, fine. Why don't I why don't I just show you a figure or two? Because I, I this is what I've tracked. Like I've I've, I've Basically, ask the question of what's the maximum number of people you can get simultaneously by doing an ex by doing a test where we do like it's called like an impulse response of recruitment. Like, what happens if you open up a hit with like five thousand assignments right now and just wait for the next thirty minutes to see what happens in terms of the number of people sitting in a waiting room? Mm -hmm. um, 
and track that as it increases over time. And then when we're done with the, the test, we just stop. We just like close down the the, the hit. And so uh, like you know we'll, we'll pay anybody that showed up, but won't recruit the actual next however many don't. Um, if you give me one second, I can I can figure out. Where. So when you figure out when you mention one thing about that relates to the good relation therapy is that this strategy seems like something that trackers would not like, but in fact, they in fact doing it in almost any case. So good, like heavy trackers, which, which which you would find a lot of the time, unless you really make an effort not to get them, um, are people who run multiple experiments. And the standard way to do run experiments, they would just, if they see an, a heap that interests them, the recruiter is good, or it's something that they, they've seen, they know that this, this will be uh, taken by other people. So what they do, they accept the hit. And then they let it sit. And they will accept five of those hits. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if they are brought into a waiting room, you, want, you could think, like, who wants to sit there and see the waiting room? But for the general flow of characters, it's not a problem at all. Because anyhow, they're doing this kind of waiting room. They see the instructions, they see it's OK. If not, they return it. But if they, they, they kind of just, just let five of those open. And you, I originally thought I, I should have fight this habit, and I, I thought of all sorts of measures to fight it, and then realized actually there's no way to fight it. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to be good therapists. This just the, the it's a theological thing. The system brings them to do that. So the way they actually do it, that's when it starts. I mean, if they open five windows or five, windows. they open the five windows and expect all the tasks to have like infinite amount of waiting time. This is something I'll talk about in my talk, and then. They would just go about and do them one by one. And they kind of prioritize what seems like fun, you know, the instruction seems like crazy, I don't know. So they would do it, but they, they will open yeah. five of them in simultaneous way. But if you want them to really interact with the others, don't you need to start it the moment they serve it? Yeah, but I'm saying they will open five windows and they see the waiting room is like progressing. And then they just wait there and do their another task. And then they but they will wait when you want them to wait. I mean, they will, they'll, they'll be in the room when you want them to be in the room. I think it's for the flow of workers, yeah, right. waiting room is much more. It's much more feasible than you would think. Like I would, I wouldn't want. If, if it was the only thing I would do, I would be really. If it was a game and I want to play the game, it would be really devastating. to be there for an hour, but it's not what happens. They will do other tasks in the same. It's also the same reason that you typically want a lot. A lot more time than the task actually takes. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the waiting room actually. So, normally the way that it works with online games is that those require lots of people to be in a space as well and mm -hmm. wait. And then, or even if you've ever done like a Zoom meeting, you get into the Zoom meeting yeah. and it says, okay, are you ready to join? And I could just imagine a version of the waiting room that does that where it's like, okay, now we're ready. Press join when you're ready. And if they don't do that within like a couple minutes, then they get kicked and they get sent to the back of the queue for a different waiting right. room, say. Um, we don't do that, okay. but yeah, can imagine. Because the otherwise they're just jumping straight into the, I'm just thinking of the experience of a Turco who gets, for some reason they, they accept the hit and then they go through the instructions and then they reach the waiting room and they decide to do other stuff. Um, then maybe they don't come back to, do they ever get kicked or? If, if the hit times out, mm -hmm. I think then we would get an assignment abandoned message back from Mechanical Turk. Yeah. And that would decrement the quorum value. Mm -hmm. And so then we'd, rec we'd let another person into the waiting room. But that requires that the hit times yeah, out. So yeah, it's, so. It's, it's, it's. so once they get into the waiting room, they are, they are there and they could ruin the experience for 9, 10, yeah. 200 other people. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Um, the waiting room has a concept of a quorum, which is the number of people that must be present in the waiting room for it to proceed to the, the study. Here, what I've done is I recruited, um, uh, I, what did I do? Give me a second. Um, this is, this is setting the, the like, this is the recruitment goal with over recruitment, so that I'm recruiting 36 people with some multiple over recruitment, like like it's maybe two or something. 128 people with a multiple two, 2,000 people with an over recruitment of two. 
And uh, what this is plotting is the total number of people that have arrived to the waiting room as a function of uh, time. Uh, the vertical axis goes from zero up to 350 at the top, and the horizontal axis goes from zero to 1,000 units of seconds. Um, and uh, so what you see, each curve is uh, the like uh, cumulative number of people that have arrived in that test. Uh, start at the bottom, we're recruiting 36 people, and the payment is $1 for the, 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 the hit. Uh, and what you see is that uh, we get up to 36 in a reasonable amount of time, though like it happens more quickly at first and then slows down. Uh, 128, similarly, like recruitment's quite fast at the beginning, but then there's, it, it, it slows down. So this is the time until this filled out. So that's the, I, I, I just don't, these are the total number that arrived, but somebody left. So how, this is not indicated here? Or this is just a cumulative number that... This is the cumulative number of people that have arrived in the waiting Room. But how many people stayed there? Right. So this is another factor. Oh, hmm. they basically all stay there. But they also. I mean, the, the the assignment is literally like, hi, we're like you may be sitting in this, in this waiting room for a little while, but um, this is we're just doing a test of our system. Please come here and just wait in the waiting room, and then okay. we'll give you the payment once you're done. So it's very different from when they actually mm -hmm. wait an experiment or something, and then they may go because their time is out or they're just bored or something, or just leave the window open and continue with their lives. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I mean, I would, okay. Do, you, yeah. do you have something like a checkbox at the end saying, I was really here when it's changed? or? I have a, a bit of information that might be helpful for this because I did quite a lot of work on the Grid Universe demo trying to debug problems with the waiting room and um, contention on the database. And what I saw was that very few people gave up within about eight minutes. And once it hits 20, most people do it. And, but that was an experiment where they were not warned that there was going to be a waiting room. They just clicked onto it and they got a waiting room. So. Mm -hmm. If you warn them, that will probably not be quite bad. Apart from testing the patients, is there any um, punishment for over accepting for the, for the workers in the system? For over accepting? Like yes. over they can disengage in you know, very many activities in the. Oh, you mean like if M Turk has like a system for saying you have accepted too many hits right now, you can't possibly no, be doing all that? I mean, I don't think the mechanical trick has a, has a system for them accepting more than one hit, right? Because no. it's already them circumventing the system. Wait, are you asking as a recruiter or as a participant? Yeah, in general, Aren't they already using they... more than one account? They can do more than one hit at a time, I'm pretty sure, right? By what means? I mean, I know they, they, have accept, they, they accept multiple people. I know they have tools for doing it, but the, the single single browser window mechanical trick doesn't allow you to accept multiple hits. You accept the hit and it shows you the hit. Uh, uh, I think they can open multiple windows. Yeah, just have right, tabs. Right. So just the system. Opening multiple, multiple tabs, tabs doesn't sound like circumventing the system. It is when the system itself is not allowing you to open up more than one bit. I think I you can do it. I, 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 I'd I be shocked it. if that were not in contravention of the... I, I know they do it all the time, but uh, I, I'd be shocked if that were not... I think the, the system could easily block it because yeah. say you are you accepted it. And I account. don't think it does, it does that. So, I mean, if, if they weren't... If they want to block it, yeah. really want to block it, it was super simple, right? Mm -hmm. so it, basically, it basically just means that like when you set a time limit on Mechanical Turk, like that is your expectations with respect to no. their completion. I want to emphasize that it's not the case. It's surprising, but it's not the case. And it's not the way I tried that mm -hmm. and I thought it would mm -hmm. be the case. And your experience, the, you'll get um, nasty emails who say, yes. why dare you? For six minutes, thus giving us twenty minutes. Yes. That's what you get. What people expect. Nasty in what direction? Though? It's too short. Yes, because what they want you to do, and this is what they expect, and this is somehow the 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 right. You would expect, you would imagine, as a requester, that a six-minute thing, right, would be an indication of how long the task. No. They want to see it in the ad or in description of the message, and the. 
total lead time is going to be an hour. Mm -hmm. So for example, you pay a cent, like 10 cents for something that lasts an hour in the system, lasts an hour, they totally accept it. Mm -hmm. It's counterintuitive, but that's the way it works mm -hmm. because they're doing what we're saying. So they basically, they will accept in parallel a number of hits. And right. the thing is, that, like, these are people. You can explain whatever you need them to do to them, and they'll understand it. Like in, in our hits with waiting rooms, we very often just say, like, "Hi, this is an experiment where, like, you're going to be interacting with other people. The only way for this to work out is if you wait for them and actually do this. And so, like, please don't go away and do some other thing because what we actually need you to do for this experiment is to be present when the other people arrive. Like, we write that into the hit, and yeah. You know, so, what I would just emphasize what I wanted, the point I was making. There is a configuration variable in Downjar in, in MTurk basically who says the duration of the heats. And that variable in the way in the current yeah, community yeah. of Downjar is yeah. expected to be infinite. Mm -hmm. And people are not frustrated that this number is infinite and you pay just a finite amount of time because they know they ex they protect they expect you to put in infinite time and then somehow in a different system. Uh, con convey to them the actual duration of the experiment and the payment, and you exp they expect them to be fair in that respect. But they don't like when this time limit is really related to the task duration, because that limits them from doing from this. Starting it whenever they want. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. Not and just starting it. Is, yeah. So for too. every experiment, that makes perfect sense. For every experiment where one participant's actions, their timing of it is not dependent on other people's timing of it. That seems like, yes, that is the canonical way to go, recommended, give people a huge amount of time to do it, and then if you want if you want them to actually, if you want a participant to only be allowed to spend six minutes doing your task, fine. Say, you can have any six minute window in this larger four hour window. Mm -hmm. Like, that's fine. In this particular case where you're mm -hmm. doing synchronous recruitment, mm -hmm. it is better to explain to people that, that this experiment will not work, though it takes six minutes to actually perform it, this experiment will not work if I give you the flexibility to choose any six minute window in a four hour window, mm -hmm. because specifically what we need for this experiment is for you to all be there at once. And so we just ask them, if you're going to accept this, please do the hit right away, because what we're specifically trying to do is make other people come there. And it works, it's fine. Like, like we, you know, it, it may be hard to do that to get 500 people, we've never, We've never done that. All the experiments we've run, the max in terms of simultaneous participants is maybe like 64 we've done and been able to reliably recruit 64. Mm -hmm. You basically ask for 128 and you wait until the 64th arrives and you just tell them all beforehand like, please just wait around. And when you're doing over recruitment, it doesn't take 15 minutes to get the 64th. Like we can reliably get 64 in four minutes. Mm -hmm. And sitting there for four minutes when not not that you've told them, not that you're just like surprised you need to wait a while. It's like, hi, in the ad for this, we said, look, like if you accept this hit, this is one that requires it's it's a multiplayer game, it'll be fun, but like the only way this will work is if you wait until everybody else shows up and you just do this right away. Mm -hmm. They they do it and it's and, it, and it's fine. So I think about, so apart from being eloquent and over recruiting, there is no practical way to but that's why but that's why they said that you you could do a couple of things one is um just pay the people <laughs> the extra people or you could have the people who come that are beyond what you need go do some other task so i think that sound that's actually really really yeah, good the, there's there another the another alternative which requires implementation but another thing if you think, instead of having the task recruiting one cohort of 64 yeah. people. You can have a multiple cohort of 64 mm -hmm. people. And that's how I basically think of, I mean, I'm recruiting cohorts of one person, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm over recruiting and it does work the same way. So you can imagine the same thing. It's then, then it's much easier. Because then you can ask, give them an hour. You don't care whenever they recruit, as long as there's cohorts of 64 right. people circulating over time. Right. But I agree that both strategies mm -hmm. are good and the strategies that I'm proposing is probably not supported in the code, so it's going to be difficult to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you, do you mind sharing just on the side graph in the slides? The, like sharing it in what sense? Just putting it in the presentation. presentation. I think the, it gives an idea of And it looks like you should pay half a dollar and not two dollars. Yeah.
Okay, I just wanted to show a little bit of the server-side code that deals with quorum and waiting room status because um, it's good to understand and also introduces a couple caveats that I'll talk about. So basically the way this works is this is, um, this is a subsection of the create participant route. So we've done some other stuff before this, but relevant to waiting rooms, we count the number of participants who are either currently working are already over recruited, have submitted the hit or have already been approved. So these are the sort of non rejected participants. And um, we add one to that to account for the participant we're about to add. And then using that number, we <clears throat> determine whether or not we are already over recruited. And that decision is delegated to your experiment. Your experiment has an is over recruited method that gets past that count. So that is, there's room for customization there. If we are over recruited, we set the new participant status accordingly. And um, we're going to return a JSON representation of the participant. So that's what that result equals bit is about. But the last thing we do before returning is if your experiment has defined a truthy quorum, mm -hmm. one or more basically, mm -hmm. we are going to message all the other waiting room people using uh, Redis queue so that they know uh, to either update the status bar or let people through. And yes, that's that. So there are some, some gotchas. Um, because workers that have already submitted or been approved always are counted towards the quorum. That means that if you are trying to run um, a multiple ser series of recruitments, like I would like to be having 10 people at a time do a game, but I want to do that four times within a single experiment. You can't do that because you're going to exhaust the quorum for the first game and it's going to be exhausted forever after. You're going to have exceeded the quorum number, so it's never going to recruit for your second round. So that's something that could probably be addressed, but that's how it works now. Um, another thing that just last week I was debugging, uh, there was an experiment where it was important that it be the same, and I'm sure this is true of most, <laughs> You want the same people for the entire duration of the game. You don't want nine people who did the whole thing, one person left, and then you had a new person play the second half of the game. And that can happen because if, if someone returns the hit, I think this can happen. Um, people with more MTurk expertise can correct me. But you can return the hit if you're already in the experiment if that happens, Mechanical Turk will send us a message, hit assignment returned. We will change the status of that participant to be returned. They will no longer be counted in that non-failed count. So then when the next person joins, we're no longer over recruited and suddenly we have a new person in round four. Can of you fail participant that after the participant arrived and see something like the attention check, you basically pay them and then fail them? Up to you, right? But that check. will solve the problem, right? Oh, I see. Right, so the, the message you fail. get would be, right, assignment rejected. There's a bunch of uh, stuff you can fail. do. Um, 
and it is more that you need to be aware of this if you're mm -hmm. in your waiting room because there are unintended consequences. Um, mm -hmm. You could also, for example, change your is over recruited method to see if anyone had returned, and then that way people would get sent out. Right. It's not intuitive and it's not documented. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so this one, I guess this illustrates your point. You can override is over recruited to do something more sophisticated, like you could check are there any participant nodes? If there are, that means the, the experiment has started, and so we're, we're definitely over recruited. That would be one way to prevent people coming in halfway. Um, let's see, yeah, this is sort of tacked on, and it's probably very obvious given all the activities we did yesterday, but this was just sort of a, a quick, quick implementation of how you can pay people for waiting, because that's something some experimenters have, have elected to do. Uh, you do that in your bonus method, just comparing, my, my implementation compares the creation time of the participant, which is effectively when they land in the waiting room, because it's the waiting room that's responsible for doing that. And then the creation time of their node, which is created when they land in the experiment page. And mm -hmm. otherwise, it's the same as the example we had earlier for paying for total participation time. So that's that. Should I launch right into WebSockets or? We covered that pretty well. Um, I'm guessing some of you have used WebSockets before. I am not one of those people. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said you had. So. No, I think that uh, Peter said. Okay. Um, you've used what? You've only used it passively. Oh. Right. Okay. So um, I think I have a, yeah. Oh, what they are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a, an yeah an alternative to a full request res HTTP request response. It is not HTTP actually. It it uses TCP and um, a lot of, has a lot of commonality with HTTP, but it's a different sort of communication protocol. It's bidirectional, so. Um, HTTP the client always has to ask for something and then the server gives it back. With WebSockets, the server can actively push information to the client. Mm. And uh, there's less overhead and I couldn't define the specifics of what that is, but I trust it to be true. Mm -hmm. Is it just because you do, is this how we get like notifications on our phone? For example, I like with push know. notifications. Same flavor, Same whether flavor. it's actually. Because otherwise you have to keep pinging the server. Exactly. Right? And that costs server time, it costs client time. Exactly. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, so when are they useful? Um, yeah, as I said, it allows the server to push updates so you don't need to pull. Right, just keep. Um, otherwise, with, with pure HTTP, if you want very um, current information from the server, you just have to keep asking it like crazy. And if you have many <laughs> clients doing that, they're all asking like crazy, probably the same route on your mm -hmm. experiment, which is a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be challenging with polling to have very precise coordination between different participants who are all doing something very interactive. So. Uh, I had never used WebSockets until working on Jordan's Grid Universe game, which is a, a sort of game of life thing where there's a grid and you're a player on the grid and you're running around using arrow keys, all trying to consume food and you're bumping into each other and you're hitting walls and mm. everyone has to have the same view of this universe and trying to do that with everyone sending lots of requests would be insane. Um, yeah, the waiting room is the one instance of WebSocket implementation that's in Dallinger Core now. Um, and you saw a little bit of that. The server, whenever someone new 
joins, the server will send a message to all the clients about the status of the waiting room so they don't have to keep asking. Mm -hmm. So some pros, um, mostly already discussed. It's much more um, low noise, high signal. You're, you're basically sending the information that's valuable. You're not just constantly asking in case something's happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, coordination is easier, and I find it, once you're in a use case where it's appropriate, I found it much easier to understand. You just, you know, tell me when something relevant happens and I'll respond. And, and the code is also easier to understand in some cases, I think. Um, cons, we haven't documented at all. Uh, no demos use it other than the waiting room. Does it no, it does not. Yeah. It uses polling. Yeah. I thought it used sockets, but it does not. Um, with with the the Dallinger REST API, the database commit machinery is tied to the request cycle, so you get that without thinking about it. If you call create info, it will start a transaction. It will do all the potentially complicated interdependent things it needs to do. And at the end of the request, it will make sure that everything has happened and do any rollbacks if there's inconsistent stuff. So in this case, if you're using WebSockets, you need to worry about that. And last, as a con, I would include that this is a case where You've now introduced a decision, well, both something more to know how to do and also something to decide whether to use in a given case, which is cognitive load. Mm -hmm. So a couple examples. So this was, um, I just did a chat room partial re-implementation using WebSockets. So mm -hmm. chat room is an existing that demo. Makes sense. So here is the relevant stuff as it's, this is pulled directly from the chat room demo using polling, which is what we do. And I've, without even like thinking about what it is, just looking at the code, it's like, okay, this is a lot of stuff. Um, we're doing two things. We are uh, in a loop every 100 milliseconds, that's what that set timeout stuff, we're doing a, a call to the server for, get, for transmissions sent to the node of the person who's viewing the page. And then for each transmission, we are then calling display info, which itself makes another call to the server for that specific info, and then we can update our page. Um, by contrast, the WebSocket implementation, there's a little boilerplate. We're using an extra library reconnecting WebSocket, which I assume we're using because it reconnects. <laughs> um, so that's just import and boilerplate stuff. But the, the meat of it is just you register on the socket you've created, you, you register this callback. When a message comes in, you do something with the message. Mm -hmm. And you know the format of your message and, and can deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very similarly simple uh, interface for sending messages to the server. It's socket send, I think. And um, there is a, a server side component to this because the server also has to listen to the same channel, but also quite easy to set up. So, in terms of the front end, this is it, or there's like hidden stuff that we haven't seen? There's a little hidden server stuff. But oh, the server side, okay. But yeah, yeah. The front end is like more stuff that. No. No, okay. no. And another question about it is like, is it like likely to be blocked by firewalls or something like that? Or I don't know. Matthew, do you have any questions? It's 
not likely to be blocked by firewalls, but it's likely to be blocked by um, like web filtering software. Mm. I've had problems in schools and this kind of place with web softwares. Cool. Mm. So, for example, our institute by default uh, would not allow anything that is not HTTPS. Uh, maybe UDP. So if it's if it's a UDP, I I, I can imagine they can block UDP because now Skype or something like that. My understanding. They have application yeah. specific code. So it's like a, it's a well, my understanding of it, and I may be way out there, <coughs> is that the socket itself is wrapped inside uh, the HTTP on whatever port it's happening on. So I think what happens is it says. Uh, I want a WebSocket request, and then that connection becomes the WebSocket. Right, the connection is renegotiated. Yeah. So I think, and again, I, I don't know this for sure, I think it should be fine with a firewall, as long as the firewall is looking at things like uh, what ports it is, and is it being negotiated correctly. If you've got something standing in the way of web requests, such as um, a child filter or um, some sort of uh, thing to make sure that people don't access things they aren't supposed to look at at work, then it's possible that that will block the request to switch to a web socket. This is the last slide. There are a couple experiments that you could look at, for examples, uh, Grid Universe, which we talked about, uses WebSockets extensively. And then uh, this memory experiment is an experiment that originally used polling and had problems with that. And I redid bits of it to use, uh, to use WebSocket instead. I think that's it.